Film critic Philip French talking to Louis Mal. Louis Mal emerged in the 1950s during that explosion of cinematic activity known as the French New Wave. The self-publicizing leaders of the movement intended to make a clean break with the past. But Mal saw himself as renewing the great French humanist tradition of narrative filmmaking. At the age of 24, he shared a Hollywood Oscar with Jacques Cousteau for the documentary The Silent World. The following year, 1957, he made his feature film debut with the immaculate thriller Lift to the Scaffold. Over the 35 years since then, he's created a body of work unmatched, in my view, by his contemporaries for its variety, its consistency, and above all, its storytelling power. In Lift the Scaffold, it is on the face of it a well, cold, impersonal thriller. But in fact, looking back on it now, we can see that it contains a great many of the themes and preoccupations and situations and characters that recur throughout your work. Were you, are you surprised that it should turn out to be so characteristic a work in that way? Well, it's funny because, you know, for me, when I did it, I was trying to break into the industry. I was trying to become a director. I choose this... Uh, Thriller, you know, like uh, I was trying to entertain, I suppose. And it's only years later that seeing it again that I realized that actually uh, I'd really put a lot of uh, myself into it, although uh, uh, I didn't know at the time. And I remember my sort of a, my ambivalence was that I was attracted at the same time. I was fascinated by Robert Bresson and by Hitchcock. So strangely enough, uh, Ascenseur is a sort of, a, part of it goes the Bresson way, scenes in, in the elevator, for instance, that are very Bressonian in the sense that it's this man alone, and, and like uh, a condemned man escape, you know, in the, it's sort of a cell, if you want. And of course, the Frida part, which is, uh, which is all about, uh, uh, you know, the somewhat Hitchcockian, I was sort of, a, in my early years, I was really uh, searching. I was trying different things. I remember right after Ascenseur, I wanted to make a very personal film. And uh, The Lovers was my idea. I worked with a, a writer. I worked with Louise de Villemorin. But I brought her the idea. And it was actually taken from something that happened in my own family a few years before. And it was, and I sort of naturally came to that style, which was, trendy at the time of those long takes. Uh, I played it to at, as much as I could. You know, it's nothing but shots that goes on, go on for four or five minutes. 
I realized in the editing that I was not too happy with it, that somehow it was a little cute for me, a little uh, soft, a little uh, aesthetic. Uh, I, I didn't enjoy it. I wanted to, to be able to cut, and I couldn't. So I went completely the other way with Zazie, and Zazie was another experience taken from that wonderful book of Raymond Queneau, and which was sort of a experimenting with the literary language, and I tried to do the same thing with the cinematic language. It was a series of uh, provocations. Car du taximan et de manuel suspendu à 300 mètres dans l'atmosphère, et de mon épouse, la douce Albertine, demeurée au foyer, je ne sais en ce moment précis et ici même. Je ne sais que ceci, les voilà presque morts, puisqu'ils sont des absents. Les voilà presque morts, puisqu'ils sont des absents. Un rien la main, un rien la nuit, un rien l'emmène. You spoken of Le Feu Follet as being the film that um, you felt really the first that fully satisfied you. And this is a movie about a youngish, burnt out man, uh, sick of the society in which he lives, contemplating and then committing suicide. What was the nature you thought of the achievement of that film? It is very close to me because, because it happened that uh, that same story of uh, a friend of mine who sort of saying goodbye to his friends and and eventually committing suicide. Uh, so something very similar happened to me. So I was enormously involved in the the material, if you want. And then it seems to me that uh, um, shooting in a sort of very austere way in black and white, concentrating on one character. Uh, I felt for the first time, maybe, that I had complete control on what I was doing. I wouldn't say that it was a documentary technique, but uh, I think because I work, for instance, with a very small crew, which I've always much preferred to, you know, huge uh, operations, uh, I felt very close to the way I like to make films, and I, that's why I like to make documentaries, which is to almost like a writer writing. It's uh, something very, very direct not having to deal with 150 people, but being able to deal with such a small crew and such a small number of people that you can really express yourself um, with the greatest concentration. In developing a screenplay, uh, do your characters take over and, as it were, dictate the course of the story, or are they shaped by as they might be shaped by fate? Well. The more I go, the more I try to let my characters uh, loose. Uh, and I must say, for instance, when I start a new screenplay or I have a new idea, it usually comes from human beings and not a situation or an abstract uh, theme. Or I'm, I'm interested in somebody, and something happens to this somebody and how he or she reacts. And, and of course, the, the screenplay gets written as you try to imagine how this, this character would react. I I'm, don't try, or when I do, I'm usually in the wrong, to force a character into a plot. I might have done that with Ascenseur, because it was a thriller. Uh, I might. I've done it a couple of times uh, in some of my films that I'm not particularly proud of. But basically, 
when, uh, for instance, if you take the example of Lacombe Lucien, I imagine this young peasant by accident entering the, the French Gestapo. And then uh, I try to imagine uh, how he would react, what he would like, what he would dislike, how he would behave. And that gave me the screenplay. <laughs> I was lucky enough, after intense and long research, to find this boy, Pierre Blaise, who I knew immediately, knew everything about the character, about Lucien. He, he was Lucien, he was very close to him, and even if he was different in certain ways, he would have a, a sort of a instinctive, a, a life experience of this character. There was a scene where uh, Lucien was supposed to uh, kill a, a chicken at a mother's uh, farm. So I, I sort of prepared something and, uh, and uh, Pierre Blaise said, oh, that's not the way I do it. And he explained to me that he would catch the chicken and sort of uh, chop his head off. Looking back, we can see a clear pattern in Mal's work. From 1964 until 1980, all of his feature films were set in the past, including his first American picture, Pretty Baby, which expressed his love of American culture and his lifelong passion for jazz. But he always remained in close contact with the present as he traveled the world making documentaries, including the classic Phantom India. Then, in what I see as a triumphant fashion, Mal brought together these two sides of his work, fiction and documentary, in the thriller, Atlantic City. Come on, Peppy, come on. Come on, you little mutt. This ain't my dog. Belongs to the lady downstairs. Yeah. I'm more of a German shepherd type of guy. Is that right, Peppy? Yeah. Huh? Doing the old lady a favor. There's the building. Shame you never saw it in the old days. A real work of art. They're going to tear it down now and build a casino. When I first went to Atlantic City, uh, my immediate temptation was to, to I mean, I said, it would be a wonderful documentary. The casino, casinos and the gambling had just been legalized a few months before. It was a crazy scene. The old Atlantic City, the new, and the sort of strange melange of population and what was going on, and you could see it was, it was chaotic and, and enormously alive and, and bizarre. So, <clears throat> but my luck was to have uh, for collaborator uh, this wonderful American playwright, uh, John Guare, who sort of uh, took care, uh, managed to, we managed to come up with a screenplay where you could say that uh, the main character was Atlantic City itself. And, uh, and of course, the confrontation of the, uh, the old and the new, the old represented by this sort of two-bit gangster played by a Burt Lancaster, and the new generation played by Susan Sarandon. Premier exercice. Uh, une voiture, répétez. C'est une voiture. Une voiture. Name Capone mean anything to you? Al Capone? Godfather? Lucky Luciano, Dutch Schultz, Maya Lasky. Did you know them? You work for the people who work for the people. I was taking the shine to. <laughs> Pardon me, but you don't exactly look like uh, the king of the mobs. <laughs> <laughs> well, a few wrong turnings, wrong affections, some mistakes. So 
Oh, shit, now. It's a shame you never saw Atlantic City when it had Floy Floy. Remember the song Flatfoot Fluji with the Floy Floy? No. Hepcat and the Zoot Suit? That was the Fluji part. Yeah. yeah. The Floy Floy. That was something special. What I really like about Atlantic City that I think it not only gives you a real sense of uh, what Atlantic City was about at this very moment, but also it was like a premonition of the decade to come, because it was about greed, it was about, uh, uh, it was about the sort of, a, a, a sort of a instant gratification. It was about uh, everything that eventually I, I hated in the 80s, especially in America, the Reagan era. It's nice to have money to have things. This belonged to Grace's husband, Cookie Pinzer, a personal friend. Pouligny Montrachet, 1966. So, OK. I'll do it. Teach me stuff? Like what? What you know. You want information or wisdom? Both. Now think about it. I think the metaphor of Atlantic City is really about, about America where nothing lasts. You come back to the same place and it's entirely different. People are constantly moving around. They're changing so, somewhat. People and places are sort of searching for identities. I think that's what Atlantic City was about. And in a way, I could have done it as a documentary. I don't think it would have been as exciting, but, uh, but I, I could have done it just the same. Immediately after Atlantic City, uh, you embarked, not for the first time, upon a movie entirely different in style and form, the two-character piece, My Dinner with Andre, which is essentially a conversation in a restaurant between the uh, two people of the theater, the mystical Andre Gregory and the very much down-to-earth uh, Wallace Shawn. Uh, how do you feel when people speak of it as a documentary or as a slice of film theater? When it was finished, uh, the editing was endless because I had an enormous amount of material and I tried to do it, although it's very cut, I was trying to give the impression that it was uh, seamless, that it was a sort of a, a sort of a, just going along with practically no cuts, it's just this one evening. Uh, as one shot, and, uh, and I think it was perceived that way, to the point that I remember when it was first released in New York, people would come to me and they said, well, it's very interesting, it's exciting, it's fun, uh, uh, and they asked me, but what did you exactly do? Which I thought was the ultimate compliment. I really loved that because that meant they didn't see the work. I didn't know they were so small. Well, you know, frankly, I'm sort of repelled by the whole story, if you really want to know. What? Oh, yeah. Who did I think I was, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah. That's a story of some kind of spoiled princess. You know, who I think I was, the Shah of Iran? You know, I really wonder if people such as myself are really not Albert Speer Wally. You know? Hitler's architect, Albert Speer? What? No, I've been thinking a lot about him recently because uh, I think I am Speer. And I think it's time that I was caught and tried the way he was. <laughs> what are you talking about? Well, you know, he was a very cultivated man, an architect, an artist, you know, so he thought the ordinary rules of life didn't apply to him either. In the mid-1980s, after nearly a decade working in the States, you returned to France to make Urouar Les Enfants, one of your most highly regarded works, suddenly your most personal, I think. It's an autobiographical film about the friendship between a 12-year-old boy, much like your younger self, and a Jewish boy of the same age who's being hidden by the priests in a Catholic boarding school towards the end of World War II. Did you feel that the time had come then for this particular film to be made? Well, I, I thought it was the time had come for me. I didn't think in terms of it was the right time historically to, to do it because on the contrary, I, I was under the impression that 
There was like an overdose of films about the occupation and the Holocaust and uh, I was scared of it. I, I knew it was the one film that I wanted to do right. I didn't want to miss it. I didn't, I didn't want to s screw it. I really wanted to do it right. And I waited, uh, what, 20 some years. Definitely for me, uh, the most difficult moments, and uh, I remember after the first take, I was not even aware of it, but uh, I was crying I, I, because the memory was uh, so alive. It's uh, the scene when the, the man from the Gestapo enters the classroom and uh, um, calls uh, a, a Jewish name that uh, uh, we, we didn't know. And uh, it was very, very close to the way I had lived it. It's one of the scenes where I almost didn't change anything. Uh, and, uh, and I did a sort of a, a long take that was one of the few long takes I had in the film because I wanted to keep the emotion. I wanted the boy. I'd worked on, on, with him quite uh, for some trying to, to get to the, the maximum emotion. And I told him, uh, the, the, the boy who played the Bonnet, I told him, I want you to take so much time, even if it seems to you endless, you must hold it and hold it until you finally stand up and, uh, and, and go. I mean, this moment is the, the crucial moment. And, uh, and, and I did it in one long take. And, uh, and uh, of course, uh, I used the first take in the film. No springs in us. Having started in documentaries and being so interested in documentaries, I think it has helped me tremendously in my work in uh, fiction because I'm, and it's very difficult, it's almost impossible, but I'm trying through this incredibly long process of uh, fiction filmmaking where you have to prepare and repeat and, and write and cast and do it with you know, artificially, completely, to reach that moment of grace that, for instance, in Au les Enfants, I think I've, I can say that I hope I've reached several times with those children because they're not actors, so they were completely, they have this sort of innocence, to reach a moment where you think, after all this work, you're in front of the camera and you're doing it for the first time. And it's sort of happening in front of the camera, as if it was not fiction, as if it was a moment of truth. When you manage to achieve that, and of course, it's the most difficult thing to achieve for a filmmaker, then uh, you're, you know it's going to be good. 
revoir mon père. Au revoir mon père. Au revoir mon père. Au revoir, au revoir, au revoir mon père. père. Au revoir mon père. Au revoir les enfants. À bientôt. Au revoir mon père. 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 Perfect murder. The cool killer, the lover. Je Lift to the scaffold. Next Saturday at 9 on.